Okay, welcome everyone. This is uh, our virtual Dragon Con. Uh, this is the virtual Trek Track presentation on science in Star Trek Discovery um, with myself, Aaron McDonald. Um, I'm an astrophysicist and currently work as a science consultant for Star Trek, but did not work on seasons one or two of Discovery. <laughs> and with me, we have uh, Professor Mohammed Noor. I am Mohammed Noor. I'm a professor of biology at Duke University, and I'm an occasional science consultant for the Star Trek universe. Though, again, I did not work on seasons one or two. <laughs> Which are exactly what we're going to be talking about today, are uh, seasons one and two. So bring us back next year, and we'll have more to talk about. And then we'll be bragging about the great work we did. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so one of the funny things about this is, you know, we kind of have this, so I talk about astrophysics, and Mohammed talks about biology. And then in season one of Discovery, we had this scene where Paul Stamets starts to explain that it's not physics and biology, it's physics as biology. That when you get very, very, very small, it all becomes the same thing, and part of me died a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Even as a biologist, I was like, that's crazy. <laughs> 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 it's just so not right. I it's one of my favorite like one of my favorite um comics like web comics that I've seen is was an XKCD comic where they talk about the relationship of all the sciences and they have you know how sociology is applied psychology and psychology is applied biology and biology is applied chemistry chemistry is applied physics and way on the other side of the mathematicians <laughs> but <laughs> when you zoom in in biology you get you have cells and then you get to smaller and smaller things and those things are eventually made up of atoms and that's the chemistry side and then you zoom in more and it's like particles which are physics and physics is not biology <laughs> But you, you can't help but give me a hard time about it, though, Mohammed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. So uh, with that, <laughs> that little poke, I'll hand it over to Mohammed. What we're going to do is basically jump back and forth between biology, good ex biology examples, good physics examples. And we got some questions from people that we'll address. And uh, yeah, take it away. Perfect. Thank you. So every Star Trek series that's come out has had more references to genetics than the older ones. And I'm going to be talking about some genetics here in Star Trek Discovery. Now, I mean, the original series hardly had any. It's not too surprising. Voyager and Enterprise had a fair bit. But there's like a ton of references to genetics all through Discovery, often just in passing. So I'm going to focus mostly on season two, just because that's the most recent one we have. But before I go into that, let me start with some really basic terms here with this figure, just so everyone's on the same page. DNA. Yep. DNA is the heredi hereditary material for all life on Earth. It's made up of these four types of distinct building blocks that we just abbreviate as A, C, G, and T. There's stretches of eh, maybe a few thousand of these DNA letters that guide how proteins are made. These, are, these, these stretches are what we call genes. So genes then live on larger structure we call chromosomes, and chromosomes are found in the nucleus of cells of your body. So small to big, DNA, the building block, genes, chromosomes, kind of like what Dr. Aaron would say about planet, solar system, galaxy. Okay. So people inherit their DNA code from their parents. Usually they get one copy of every chromosome from their mom, one copy from their dad. I'll come back to a related point to this in just a few minutes. But everyone's DNA is just slightly different. We maybe differ at, say, half a percent of DNA sites, something like that on average. But we have billions of these DNA letters in each cell. So there are probably tens of millions of DNA letter differences between, say, me and Dr. Aaron. Now, this is exactly what DNA tests use for identifying people. It's even better than a fingerprint. And in Star Trek Discovery, the very start of this season, we saw this on the first episode where Captain Pike had to do a DNA authentication with his hand as he took command of the Enterprise, or sorry, command of the Discovery. <laughs> and that works. And what happened in that episode follows the exact same principle as how DNA tests are done in real life, like in, I don't know, criminal investigations. Um, it did happen kind of unusually fast in that episode. I already just touched it and immediately identified him as Captain Pike. But it's not inconceivable that they have some equipment that could do it much faster than we do now, you know, that far in the future. So your DNA isn't just sitting there, but it actually helps you, it helps make you into the overall form that we see. It affects how you look, it affects how you behave, lots of other things. And again, this came up a lot in season two of Discovery. So in the third episode of the season, Laurel holds up, this is kind of a gruesome scene, holds up the severed heads of both Ash Tyler and her baby. And we hear later that those were actually clones and they were correct, quote, down to their genetic codes, implying that those codes were actually important in their appearance. A few episodes later, we had Dr. Oh, this, I'm sorry, this is a spoiler. <laughs> we had Dr. Culber, quote unquote, reconstituted from his DNA. That example was a little bit more of a mixed bag. And, you know, one part that was really good, it was dead on accurate, was that the reconstituted Culber wouldn't have had scars he'd gotten in his previous form. That was really cool and well done. But DNA doesn't have memories. So if he was made just from his DNA, even if somehow made into adult form, he'd not know how to talk. He wouldn't remember anything. Uh, that's a, I don't know. Maybe they used uh, transporter logs to add memory engrams or something like that. There could be some Star Trek Hocus Pocus there. 
<laughs> in terms of behavior, Saru has said a few times, including season two, that fear is, quote, hardwired into Kelpian DNA. And again, this is potentially accurate. Maybe he has a genetic tendency to have a strong adrenaline flight rush when he senses minor threats, and that can be encoded into DNA. We see that in all sorts of prey animals here on Earth in real life. So DNA doesn't do all this directly, but DNA guides the formation of proteins. Proteins are the molecules that actually do most of this stuff. They provide structure in your body. They make chemical reactions go as enzymes. They fight disease like antibodies. But DNA doesn't guide proteins directly either. It does it through an intermediate molecule called messenger RNA. And this was really exciting. Discovery was the first Star Trek TV series to mention RNA. I was, really, I was amazed. <laughs> so Michael Burnham made a quick mention about her mRNA, which is short for messenger RNA, being a perfect match to her mom's DNA. That context was a little bit funny, but I mean, it wasn't wrong. And it was really cool that they actually mentioned RNA in there. So speaking of Michael Burnham's mom and that quote, there's a really cool Gen X piece that was introduced this season. So the red angel suit, which Michael Burnham wore, was designed to match the wearer's quote, mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA. And they said that it matched Michael Burnham's exactly. So it supposedly did this through some bioneural signature, but let's set that kind of funny piece aside. <laughs> and I said before that we inherit half our DNA from mom and half from our dad, but mitochondrial DNA is an exception. It's actually not in the nucleus of your cell. It's not even on chromosomes, but instead you inherit it fully from your mom through the mitochondria, that's a, a, an intracellular structure in, in her eggs. And surprise, surprise, they learned in that show that the Red Angel suit was actually made for Dr. Burnham, who's Michael Burnham's mom, who would, yes, have had exactly the same mitochondrial DNA letters as Michael. So that was great. I was very impressed to see that in the show. And, and yay to whoever in the writer's room came up with that. So one we last- We don't have an audience this time to be able to go, what's the mitochondria? The oh, yeah, so, of the cell. Exactly. Well, well, said. Else. <laughs> well said, exactly. The powerhouse <laughs> of the cell. <laughs> So one last Gen X thing I'll mention briefly, and this actually I'm going to jump back to season one's pilot, and one old piece. So again, everyone gets one copy of every chromosome from their mom and one from their dad. Now, what I have here in this picture, you know, I have them in different colors, but interestingly, we don't pass along the chromosomes that are identical to the ones we receive. We don't pass along exactly what we got from mom or exactly what we got from dad. Instead, we take a chunk from mom and a chunk from dad's and recombine them into new chromosomes before passing them on. This is called big surprise, recombination. <laughs> so genetic recombination was actually mentioned briefly in the Vulcan Hello about Michael Burnham's radiation exposure. But plot twist, they actually didn't mean the process I just described. There's a very similar process with exactly the same name, also called genetic recombination, that is used for repairing breaks in DNA in cells. And that's presumably what they meant, because again, it was you know, this response to the radiation exposure. I literally screamed when I heard it, because that kind of recombination is something even many biologists haven't heard of unless they work specifically on DNA repair. So again, big kudos to the writers for really getting a lot of science packed into the show. So with that, pass it back to you, Dr. Aaron. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, all that biology comes rushing back at me. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, so for me, I'm going to be talking about some physics in Star Trek Discovery. The first one I'm going to do is detecting the cloaked Klingon ships. Um, so this is from one of the major plots from season one of Discovery, where they are, like most people in the Federation, confounded and are trying to detect uh, these dastardly cloaked Klingons and trying to figure out a way to do that. Now, um, the kind of, the first, first method that they come up with um, is, is an interesting one. So <laughs> this, um, this is where we have essentially, you can kind of see in the background there, this big transmitter that they say is emitting it's like a crystal and it's emitting a signal uh, that they can use to basically use it as sonar or radar to detect a cloaked Klingon ship here. Um, the, the way they talk about this back and forth throughout the episode is pretty ambiguous about whether it's actually literally sound or if it's radio waves. Um, so sound waves are something that we call compression waves they require a medium to travel through. So you need to have air. And when you're speaking or you're listening to something through a speaker, what that's doing is it's vibrating um, the air around you that then your ears can pick up on. So we have these compression waves where the air compresses and then expands. Um, but the key to the to compression waves is that you do need a medium. So when we joke about, you know, in space, no one can hear you scream, sound doesn't travel in space, all of that stuff. That's because there is no air and sound being a compression wave requires a medium to travel through because there's no air, anything in space, there is no medium um, for that 
than sound cannot travel through space. So even though we have this like sort of vibrating sound crystally thingy on the planet, there's no way that that is literal sound that's able to leave the atmosphere and go into space to detect a Klingon ship. So let's talk about like, what if it's a radio wave? Because the term radio sometimes gets conflated with sound because we listen to things through our radios. It's just screwed everyone up. <laughs> so um, radio waves are actually part of the electromagnetic spectrum. They're technically light. Uh, but light in the very low frequency, low, uh, long wavelength part of the spectrum. So here we have the electromagnetic spectrum. Typically, when we talk about light, we're talking about what we can see, and our eyes are tuned to the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, but you can see it makes up all these other stuff. Another sort of classic sci-fi example of a species that can see in other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum is predator with the infrared component. Um, predator can see in the infrared. So these are all just different types of light. We'll come and back then, to that in a second, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, but then radio waves are this very, very long frequency. And because it's light, light doesn't require a medium to travel through. It's the electromagnetic radiation doesn't require a medium. So light can travel through space. That's why we see sunlight. That's why we have stars. All, all of that fun stuff is because information is transmitted through uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so let's assume then that what's being emitted here is uh, a radio wave. Now, regardless if it's a sound wave or a radio wave, the, com the, um, the technology behind sonar or radar, which actually sounds, S stands for sound, R stands for radio, you're using waves regardless um, to bounce off of objects reflected and come back. Now, when we're talking about things being cloaked, essentially what we're saying is that we can't, um, we can't see them no matter what. And how we see things in space is from light being emitted from those objects, whether it's as heat, whether it's you know plasma giving off light, any of that stuff, we're seeing this emission of light. Uh, the other way we can see things in space is by reflecting light off of it. So if we, you know, <laughs> shine a light on it or whatever, that light reflects off and bounces back to us. Kind of like how we can see the moon in the visible part of the spectrum. Our eyes can see the moon. That light that we're seeing from the moon isn't coming from the moon itself. It's sunlight being reflected off of it and bounced back to us. So this is an important component. But when a ship is so-called cloaked, the assumption is, is that no matter whether it's emitting light or reflecting light, you can't see it at all, which unfortunately is kind of the principle of sonar or radar, right? We're assuming it's radio waves because they travel through space. Radar requires that light to bounce off and come back. And if it's cloaked, it's not going to be able to do that no matter what. So it'll absorb it. And, you know, it turns out it didn't necessarily work. Now, another interesting component of this Again, let's assume it's radio waves uh, that are coming off of it and the electromagnetic spectrum that can travel through space. Um, why they're using this as opposed to any number of objects in space that actually do emit massive amounts of radio waves, such as um, pulsars, which are neutron stars that are giving off these beams in the pretty much in the radio frequency that we could use as beacons, almost exactly how they're describing this massive beacon on the planet. I can guarantee that the light coming off of neutron stars is going to be stronger than what's coming off of the planet because the energy and all of that behind neutron stars is just, it's bonkers. So, um, so let's, I mean, like they did in the show, this isn't going to work. So let's look at some of our other options that we have here. Um, it's not going to work for many reasons. <laughs> One being sound doesn't travel through space. Two being it's a cloaked thing on ship, so it's not going to absorb or reflect anything. Um, so let's come up with something else. This is where it gets really good. This is where I get really excited about it. Um, so there's this thing in space called gravitational lensing, and it comes from the idea of uh, general relativity that was introduced by Einstein that essentially said our universe is a sheet of space and time. It's four-dimensional fabric, and when you introduce mass into that fabric, that sheet will curve, um, like a lot of people have seen the image of a bowling ball on a trampoline. And then when you have that bowling ball on the trampoline, you can flick marbles around it and they'll orbit just like the moon orbits the earth or the planets orbit the sun because they're in this gravitational well. But another component of this gravitational well is what if you just flick the marble with enough speed, it just kind of coasts right by. 
its light is going to get curved as it passes and then you trace it back to where you think it came from it's going to be in a slightly different position and this is what we call gravitational lensing it's light getting lensed around a massive object such that it appears to be in a slightly different position than what it is and we do see this effect this was one of the first tests of einstein's theory of general relativity that um when he said this would happen. They said, all right, well, we'll test that. And during a solar eclipse in 1919, they did actually go and see where the, you know, when the sun was blocked, they could see the stars that would be there were, appeared to be in a slightly different position because the, the light from them was lensed around the mass of the sun. Um, but now it's, so that was like one test. Now it's used all the time. Now that we have advanced telescopes and we observe space through many different media and much better technology, um, we're able to see gravitational lensing from mostly galaxy clusters or from galaxies that are lensed around other massive galaxies. So you can see here, the telescope is seeing the same galaxy appearing in different positions in the sky. And you can tell it's the same galaxy, not just because it looks the same, but the spectrum is actually identical. So it is the same galaxy. The light is just being lensed around in different directions and then appearing to us to be coming from, from two different spots. So uh, we see this all the time. This is my favorite image from Hubble, <laughs> the, the smiley face <laughs> of galaxies being almost perfectly aligned. So they almost get curved completely around here. But if you search for the term Einstein's crosses, those are usually from the slight misalignment, they appear in multiple positions in the sky. Um, and this is how we now detect dark matter. When we first kind of were, you know, studying our galaxy, what we realized was that stars were orbiting our galaxy much faster than we expected them to be based on how much stuff was there. When you talk about marbles orbiting bowling balls, the further ones out are going to orbit a little bit slower, and that's based on the mass and that gravitational well that's present. Well, they can do the same thing with the mass of our galaxy and assume that these faraway stars are orbiting slower based on the mass that's there. And they're orbiting a lot faster, which means that gravitational well is a lot deeper, which means that there's mass there that we just can't see. There's something there that's interacting gravitationally, but has no electromagnetic component to it whatsoever. Um, and so now this is how, and this was a, a cluster where we mapped out the pink region is the matter that we could actually detect. That blue region is where we've mapped out that there's mass there but using the lensing from the background stars um, or galaxies in this point um, to actually see that there's mass there, we just can't detect it at all. Um, which sounds a lot like trying to find a cloaked Klingon ship that has a gravitational presence, but it has no electromagnetic component whatsoever. So I love this diagram from Discovery where they're talking about this and how are we gonna solve this? That cloaked vessel, that bubble is the gravitational presence of the ship but we have no way of seeing it. And so they come up with this idea of like, okay, well, what if we do gravitational lensing? So we'll map out the background stars and then we'll triangulate. We'll jump to another position, map all the background stars because the mass of a cloaked Klingon ship is gonna be much less than like galaxy clusters. <laughs> so, so these, they call micro gravitational lensing, seeing how the slight differences in the appearance of where this background stars are could give you a hint to the presence of this. So. Triangulation is a thing that's been around for, for a long time. Um, basically, since we've tried mapping things, it's, all right, map the coastline, go to a different position, map the coastline again, go to a different position. You know, when we weren't able to fly up and actually look at the coastline, triangulation is how they were able to do that. And again, it's used in modern technology all of the time. Um, and so that's exactly what they do. They make these jumps, which I think is like 133 jumps, if I remember correctly. Random number. I can't justify that. <laughs> something close to that. If it wasn't exactly it, that, it was something close. Exactly. It would have to be a lot because, like I said, the, the mass is not that much. So you do have to see these tiny, tiny, tiny changes in the background, especially if you're triangulating it to a small point. But that's exactly what they did. Jump to another position, map it. Jump to another, see those distortions, and then you can find the cloaked Klingon ship. Um, and I love it. And as I always like to say now, cloaked Klingon ships are what dark matter is. <laughs> So, um, but the way they explain it is brilliant. And I just, I, I love this. This is all, um, by the way, from the mid-season finale. I think it's episode nine of season one is where they go into all of that detail. So that's the power of math, people. <laughs> <laughs> love that quote too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, let's jump back to some biology now. And this actually relates to some of the questions we got both from uh, Twitter and Facebook. So I have some of the questions posted up there. Uh, can you explain the kelpians, the threat ganglia, their late life metamorphosis, et cetera? The other ones, can you explain Saru's ecology? So 
this is great. Happy to dive into that. Um, jumping right in. Most of this was covered in, uh, obviously, in season two of Discovery. And there was one particular episode, too, that was written by the amazing writing duo, Bowie Kim and uh, Erica Lippold. So we got to know a lot about the Kelpians and basically just in general, like, you know, Saru is the main focus, but we get to know, know a lot about their abilities. So one thing that came out fairly early on is they have senses beyond humans. And we see this in the context of Saru's uh, threat ganglia that sort of dangle behind. He has a sort of spidey sense for danger, right? Um, having some sort of visible manifestation to, you know, being threatened or being in danger is not uncommon. One cute example I love is the African pygmy hedgehog, <laughs> which like falls up into this ball and will sometimes hiss and, and shake out its spines when it's threatened. It's not too different, except it's a little bit more you know, frightening than the threat ganglia. But other animals do it too. Vervet monkeys do distinct alarm calls for different kind of predators, for example. Uh, another one that we saw, and this was, this was, I think this was in the first episode of season two. I think that's right. Where Saru and Michael were walking down the hall, and he was kind of sniffing her, and he could smell her emotion or anticipation. Now, we do, in fact, actually exude scents that, that are consistent with our emotions. There was a study done a while back, this is a little bit funny, where people were instructed to watch either a scary movie or a not scary movie, and they sweat into these t-shirts. And they took the t-shirts and they presented these t-shirts to dogs, and dogs then mirrored their owner's stress states for when the owner was wearing it previously. And the owner wasn't even there when this was happening, so that, that's, that's pretty cool. But again, shows that we were exuding these emotion scents. Quite possible that somebody could pick up on that, as Saru did in this episode. Another one is having this... Uh, increased vision. We saw this again, I think, in the first episode of season two, where Saru's eye is, is <laughs> you see him sort of like zoom in on his eye, and it says that he's a wider optical window, which I think, hey, Dr. Aaron, you can answer my side. I think that means you can see outside the visible spectrum. Is that correct? That, that was exactly what my assumption was, is that his, his spectrum is just slightly wider. So a little bit into the ultraviolet, a little bit into the infrared. Perfect. So as you mentioned, too, that we, we know of, of predators, sometimes real predators, sometimes the, the movie predators, <laughs> which can actually see outside the spectrum. So one real world one is uh, kestrels. These are, you know, kind of hawk-like birds. They can see UV signals associated with either vole or rodent urine, and they can then home in on them. So that's pretty cool. Now, one big thing that was introduced this season, not in that particular episode I mentioned, though, was the, the vaharai, the metamorphosis that happens. I mean, it was mentioned there, too. Now, this is where, you know, you might remember the, the threat ganglia fall off, and we have this massive change in behavior. And what's interesting is that was referred to in the episode repeatedly as, like, there were the post-evolution and the pre-evolution uh, kelpians. Now, that terminology is not really right. That's not really evolution. That's just a metamorphosis. Just like, as you can see from this picture, I changed from the time I was a little kid. I didn't evolve into an adult. <laughs> or you can see from this other picture, a caterpillar going to a butterfly. And again, they don't evolve into butterflies. They just metamorphose or develop into butterflies. But still, it's still pretty cool having this dramatic change. Now, with that, and this comes to one of the questions that was uh, submitted to, it's quite possible you would have behavioral changes or possible diet changes. So in the context of the Kelpians, we saw they ate kelp somehow. I, I don't know how. I never picked up on the fact. Maybe that's why they're called Kelpians, <laughs> but makes sense. <laughs> post, Mind blown. <laughs> right? Exactly. Post, uh, post Faharai, I don't know if, are they eating, are they eating the Ba'ul? I'm not quite sure what happens. We didn't actually see that much about what happens in terms of their diet afterwards, <laughs> but certainly there was a behavioral change there. Now let's use frogs as an example. Tadpoles are primarily vegetarian, so it's analogous to the kelp thing, whereas adult frogs are primarily eating insects and things like that. So again, primarily carnivorous. So again, we see a very clear diet change and various behavior changes associated with this metamorphosis in an individual. So that's not crazy. It's quite, it's quite reasonable. Now, one of the most shocking things we saw in this episode was Saru's new mode of defense post Faharai. <laughs> you can see this little short video clip here. Yeah, that was that was kind of shocking having this like little spikes that come out of the back of your head and shoot out at a predator. So what does that? People always say the same answer. Porcupines. No. <laughs> People assume that porcupines can do that, but porcupines can't actually shoot out their quills. They can kind of shake them and have them crawl out, but they can't really shoot them out. Um, the closest thing in terms of like a spike I could find, this was actually suggested, I think at uh, either STLB or, or DragonCon, a fan came up to me and mentioned this. And I didn't know about this, but kudos to the person who mentioned it. Um, tarantulas can kind of flick off some of their hairs. You see that in this little video here where they can flick it off at something. It kind of goes all over the place. It's not so directed like the, like the spikes in, that Saru is shooting out, but it's kind of similar. The coolest one I saw here was this bombardier beetle. So this isn't the solid thing. This is actually a liquid defense. But these are a boiling hot toxic chemicals <laughs> that they can shoot at something. That is horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good way of describing that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> so that, that's, that's pretty dramatic as a way of defense. So one of the broader questions was about this sort of change in ecology over time. So what we, what we learned was that it used to be that the, the Kelpians kind of ruled the planet in a way and the Ba'ul were subjugated and kept at small densities. 
Now on Earth, if you go back, you know, pre-65 million years ago, and let's divide groups instead of looking at individual species, let's look at broader groups, reptiles versus mammals. Pre-65 million years ago, Earth was kind of dominated by these dinosaurs, right? Then we had a massive ecological change. In our case, it was introduced by the, the asteroid impact and some volcanic activity. That knocked back the reptiles and dinosaurs in particular, and the mammals after that radiated. When I say radiated, I mean that you know, they became much more abundant. They became you know, much wider diversity of forms. It's possible there was some natural disaster on Kaminar in, within the past 2,000 years that caused that shift. That kind of thing does happen. Now, one thing that was suggested instead is that rather than a natural disaster, it could be just the Baos' embrace of technology. Maybe they got technology in a, in a faster way than the Kelpians did, and they used that to basically subjugate the Baos. Or wait, did I say that backwards? <laughs> the Baos got technology and they used it yes. to subjugate the Kelpians. Sorry, subjugate I think I said that backwards. Kelpians yeah. and then, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly, got sorry it. about that. <laughs> but all in all, there's a lot of pieces here that you know potentially could mirror things that we saw on Earth and just a lot of cool things to look at. So hope that answers the questions. Awesome. Pass it on to physics. Yeah, so fun with time <laughs> this is the best way I can describe this one. Um, so we saw some fun adventures with time uh, starting Pretty, you know, from the get-go with Discovery, um, Harry Mudd coming in, first of all, was awesome. Um, but then there was this great episode where he showed up and he had a time crystal. And so he started playing with time and basically looping over the same scenario over and over and over again on Discovery. Um, but one of the cool things that he commented was, is that he got this time crystal from a four-dimensional species. I uh, basically said that I got this from a four-dimensional species. And for me, I perked up and I was like, oh, okay, that, that works. We don't have time crystals. We don't necessarily have any way that we can play with time right now. But as I mentioned before, our universe is a four-dimensional fabric, three of which being space, which we can control. I can choose to move forward, back, left, right, up and down, however I want, but I cannot control time and that's that fourth dimension so when you have that throwaway comment saying oh this came from a four-dimensional species there's an implication there that they can exist and control in a fourth dimension and being time you space and i wormhole aliens <laughs> exactly exactly um so this you know this works for me this being the time crystal and then of course we came back again so we got to see time crystals do you remember the name of this planet i should remember the name of this planet oh uh, i don't remember I'm sorry. oh that's okay i'll flash it in here <laughs> This planet um, is, is uh, that was first introduced, I think, in Next Generation, um, but that this was sort of a holy place for Klingons and um, that they have these time crystals here. And so kind of making that same assumption that with Harry Mudd that you have these time crystals, some way of connecting to and permeating time um, kind of works. And this is an image that they had from, um, from an exhibit for props from Star Trek Discovery. So that's the, that's the uh, time crystal zoomed in there. So let's break that down to like what these time crystals actually would be. Um, there are some discussions maybe about maybe there is like a time particle of, but that's not, we haven't ever really seen any evidence of that. Where that comes from is when you're trying to think about, you know, the fundamental particles in our universe, you're, you start unifying the forces. You're starting to bring it down to its more and more fundamental level. So we talked up at the top kind of goofing around about biology and atoms and, and what those are made out of. Um, but those atoms, you know, are, if you remember the electron, proton, and neutron, those are sort of kind of where people tend to stop in their education learning about those atoms and what they're made out of. Um, but if you zoom down even further, then you start to get quarks, and then uh, you start looking at how these um, particles are actually being held together. And so if you remember, maybe you learned in school that, you know, there's four fundamental forces. We have electromagnetic force, the strong and weak nuclear forces, and then gravity being a fourth force. Um, we have found fundamental particles for electromagnetism. That's the photon, the light particle. Um, and then the strong and weak nuclear forces have fundamental particles as well. And we're able to unify those. Um, so you unify the strong and weak, then you're able to unify the electromagnetic. And that's where, you know, we're talking about Higgs bosons and all of that fun stuff. Um, we've never found a gravity particle. Um, there's a theoretical particle called the graviton, which we've heard mentioned in Star Trek before, um, but there's not really been any evidence for it. And there's a lot of discussion, you know, can we really consider gravity a force? It worked in Newtonian physics, but, you know, we also now see that gravity is just kind of the shape of our universe due to the presence of mass. So maybe thinking about gravity as a force doesn't quite work. And that was that sort of big, you know, grand idea that they've had to try to unify all them and we still haven't been able to. So 
time crystals now is kind of moving in that graviton area, right? We have the shape of our universe dictates that, how gravity works. Um, and time is a component of gravity. So maybe there's a time particle somewhere. Maybe, we, yeah, it's, it's pretty tough, but um, still fun. Great for science fiction. Um, but carrying on from that uh, into, you know, the shape of our universe, how things are work time travel, uh, we got the Red Angel. Now, the Red Angel showed up throughout season two of Discovery, um, throughout Burnham's past, and this is, it became a puzzle piece to try to track together. We learned that this is actually um, her mother in a suit that essentially builds wormholes to punch through parts of time. Um, and wormholes are great for time travel. Now, what a wormhole actually is, is a theoretical, again, construct in physics, but the math checks out. We just have never actually detected one. Basically, what it's saying is that you have space-time, and space-time overall is pretty much flat from what we've been able to see, but there might be, you know, theoretically, there might be some local areas where it's maybe like crumpled up toilet paper that you've laid it all out, and overall it's flat, but there's some parts that are folded over on top of each other. Some parts are kind of rippled a little bit, and traveling along the surface of that might take some time, but there might be points where you could shortcut and punch through. And that's technically what wormholes are. But remember, the fabric of space-time includes space and time. So in Star Trek, we typically use wormholes to travel through space, um, like connecting the Alpha Quadrant to the Gamma Quadrant, um, but they also punch holes in time. And we've seen that in other episodes too, like Eye of the Needle in Voyager talked about um, a wormhole that connected two points in space as well as time, and it's an amazing episode. <laughs> I love that one too. <laughs> so good. One of my favorites. Um, so this idea of wormholes for time travel has been introduced in Star Trek before, and it's just used here as more of a long-term overarching plot um, that we saw with the Red Angel, but that's essentially what they're doing. Now, like I said, we've never actually detected wormholes in space ourselves. Um, ways that it could be created, the big issue is that in order to warp space-time, you need the presence of mass. Einstein also came up you know, realized that E equals MC squared, that mass contains energy. So you might be able to have enough energy to bend space time in the same way you could as if there was mass there. And that could be how you kind of punch a wormhole through. And uh, yeah, and season two ended with them going through the wormhole, future, into the future. So um, yeah, the overall, I would say that, like I said, the time crystals, pretty science fiction-y. Not a whole lot of sort of scientific background to that, but wormholes are a great way to travel through time in a way that um, utilizes theoretical physics that, you know, we haven't detected them, but it's not, we're not going to write it off as being completely impossible. So that's it for that one. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, let's come back to another question from the audience here. So there's a question here about, my question is about macroscopic tardigrades. Are they even possible? This is from Terrell Kirkman. So let's talk a little bit about the tardigrade a little bit more generally too. So this is now going back to season one of Discovery where we see Ripper, as, as he was uh, aptly named. I have a picture here of Ripper on the left and then like, a standard picture of tardigrade and one I, I took of a tardigrade somebody caught just outside the building where I work. They're on the right. They are so cute. We they love are. tardigrades. My friend coined the term tardigroupies. <laughs> Love that. That's fantastic. <laughs> now they're great. They're also called water bears. You may have heard of those too. So there's some resemblance between the between Ripper and the Earth tardigrade. So overall, to the overall appearances there, people always say that tardigrades can survive the vacuum and radiation in orbit. There's some studies that have looked at that. I think those tend to get a little bit overstated because they say they can survive. But if you actually go to the original study, it's like 99% of them die, but like 1% kind of barely make it. <laughs> so survive is a, is a a bit of a stretch there. <laughs> One thing they Exactly. One thing they can do, and we saw this actually in um, in Discovery Season 1, too, is they can dehydrate and live for years all dried up. And remember when Ripper got very upset, he dried up, and, and you saw the water come out there, and he was mad, and he wouldn't, it wouldn't help them jump for a long time. That's what made Stamets have to insert the tardigrade DNA into himself, not touching that part. <laughs> there's a lot of differences, though, from the Earth tardigrades. Now, obviously, there's no antennae. There's no internal skeleton. They don't have jointed legs. They don't have lungs, so they obviously can't scream the way tardigrade did. But the big question, this is the one that came up in, in the from the audience there is can they get to be that big and the short answer is no because there's now this is actually a physics principle so you know kudos to you dr <laughs> there's this thing called the square cube law that volume grows faster than surface area as you get bigger and bigger now the cross section of muscles in this animal would grow much smaller than the mass it's supporting so you would need to be much 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 stronger than earth ones given this dramatic increase in size so the short answer is like with our kind of biology probably not but hey alien who knows maybe something's completely different there 
Um, I'm going to toss out one little thing. This wasn't asked specifically, but it's just kind of a fun piece. There was a reference to horizontal gene transfer regarding these tardigrades. I'm going to play a very short clip here. Like its microscopic cousins on Earth, the tardigrade is able to incorporate foreign DNA into its own genome via horizontal gene transfer. Okay, so this term comes up, horizontal gene transfer. Now, this is something that's common in bacteria. This is how antibiotic resistance goes from one bacteria to another bacteria, because obviously the bacteria don't mate with each other. So this graphic was actually really nice. So a nice demonstration of how, how you might see this segment of DNA going from one individual to another. It's how a lot of genetic engineering works. You may have heard of this, uh, this common thing now that's used in laboratories called CRISPR. This is basically how that essentially works. There's a lot of known cases where it's happened in nature. And this statement probably came from this particular study from 2015. Evidence for extensive horizontal gene transfer from the draft genome of a tardigrade. Now, in that study, they said that like one-sixth of the genome of tardigrades came from such transfers, and mostly from bacteria. And this got a lot of news, a lot of press, and people were like, oh, cool. I'm sure that got picked up on, since there were a lot of press releases for it, I'm sure they got picked up by the, by the writers. They're like, oh, we're using a tardigrade. We'll mention this horizontal gene transfer thing. What often happens with science is people don't see the next year when there's something showing, nope, that was actually wrong. <laughs> there is not extensive horizontal gene transfer associated with tardigrades whatsoever. Yeah, Can I just, just point out from a geeky Star Trek oh, yeah, please. the author, the lead author on the first paper is Booth B. <laughs> yes. <laughs> straight, back. straight from Starfleet Command, even if, the, if from their uh, gardening division. <laughs> But anyway, I still, I'm going to still give this a thumbs up because you know what? The writers were using press releases about real science and they tried to work it into the story. So yeah, there was a, there was a follow-up study that, that, missed, that they missed going into that. But you know what? Two thumbs up nonetheless. What was so, wrong with the original story? They basically hadn't cleared all the contamination from bacteria that were like associated with these tardigrades when they were getting the DNA sequences. And gotcha. they just basically just put, all, they put it all in there like, oh, look, there's a lot of bacterial sequence. Like, yeah, because there's a lot of bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so just kind of one final one from the physics standpoint that I really loved uh, was from the beginning of season two, where they mentioned the discovery of a non-baryonic asteroid. And this non-baryonic asteroid kind of has a lot of mass and they um, then, you know, they chip off the pieces and then they use it to help save that civilization from all of the asteroids that were falling down on top of it. Um, but non-baryonic is a very specific term. So when we when I've mentioned uh, those atoms, the protons, neutrons, all of those, those are all baryons. So they are everything in the periodic table, everything that we see, touch, that we interact with is made up of baryons. Um, when you say something is non-baryonic, you mean it's made of something else. And that is a big question. But that's one of the big questions for what dark matter is, is like dark matter can't be baryonic because we've not been able to detect it in any other way that we normally detect baryonic matter. Typically through spectroscopy, like I said, light being emitted or reflected off, you can see the spectrum and you can see what uh, is making up that stuff that we're seeing, but it's all on the periodic table. It's all made up of baryons. So when they find this non-baryonic asteroid, now you probably wouldn't be able to see, touch, feel it, you know, interact with it in the same way. Um, but they basically refer to it as a dark matter asteroid and then use that term interchangeably with the non-baryonic component. And that's absolutely correct. That is the right way to talk about it. Not to mention the fact that this non-baryonic dark matter asteroid is super massive and it uh, has a lot of a gravitational presence such that they're able to redirect all of those asteroids away from the planet to keep it from crashing and it basically attracts them all because it has a higher gravitational presence it being non-baryonic or dark matter so i really 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 like that uh just again it's like the horizontal gene transfer it's a great sort of throwaway line that is scientific and the way that they're using it is pretty accurate so that's a fun one but two thumbs up two thumbs up so I think that's it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there was any other real sciencey thing that anybody really noticed, especially from season one. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think we could probably wrap it up there. <laughs> We're just kidding, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> we got a lot of questions about Spore Drive. Spore Drive, yeah. Here's just a sample of some of the questions there. Yeah. So to get a feel for the Spore Drive, there's a TED Talk that you should see because there's a lot of context here and this clearly inspired the writers. This, this TED Talk was by a, a real world present day fungal biologist or mycologist whose name is Paul Stamets. <laughs> who'd have thought? <laughs> right? Yeah, who would have thought? <laughs> so he has a, a bit of a non-traditional background. He started as an amateur with a, bachelor, uh, with a bachelor's degree and he, he studied it a lot on his own. He has his own company, but he has this TED Talk. If you were to watch this TED Talk, it actually mentions a lot of things that are, that are 
uh, relevant to Star Trek Discovery in a, in a big way. So there's references to mycelia and this network of mycelia. Those are essentially the, you can think of it kind of like the roots of fungi. Again, Paul Stamets' name is used. They actually refer to a, a particular genus of fungus called Prototaxites. Might sound familiar. That's the same one they have the mushrooms for in the show. Uh, there was a specific quote about organisms that were paired with fungi will be rewarded. And he kind of states without a whole lot of explanation that he has no doubt they're extraterrestrial fungi. So I'm not sure quite where he got that from exactly or what exactly he meant by that. But, you know, you can see the inspiration here. And in case you're wondering, like, did this really inspire them or is this all just a coincidence? Here's a tweet from Brian Fuller from 2013, long before Discovery, that actually is talking about this particular TED Talk. He's, he really, really enjoyed it. So clearly this inspired a lot of things going on in the series. Now, some parts of this are okay in the sense that, like, can spores, you know, survive in, in space? It's, it's possible you can have some survive in space for a little bit, but there, there's these quotes like the mycelial network is a, quote, discrete subspace domain, okay, and that spreads across the universe fanning out into infinity. So notice it didn't say just like into orbit or just into our solar system, but spans across the universe to infinity. That's a lot of fungal spores. <laughs> <laughs> like a lot of things are a little bit funny too. Like, you know, when they use the spore drive, how this water kind of comes out of nowhere as though somehow these spores are like retaining water. I'm not quite yeah. sure what's happening there. We, we have, have to make it perfectly clear that water is, does not survive in space. Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely not. Well said. <laughs> why living things do not. It's, it, it'll be frozen ice form and that's not great for living things. Absolutely, absolutely. Then we have this extreme techno babble. This is from uh, one of the after treks from the first season. It says, the laser photon emissions are comprised entirely of exotic matter found in the mycelial plane. Now, when that matter integrates with Stamets' own neural material, it should restore his cognitive function. I remember when that came up, I was like, what? <laughs> There's so much there that needs uh, a little bit of uh, taking apart. Fortunately, yeah. Dr. Aaron has a hypothesis that, you know, at least gets us closer. So <laughs> Unpacks it a little bit. Let's unpack, unpack it. Please. Um, yeah, I'd love to throw that techno babble of the week over to you. Just if we just count <laughs> up the amount of biology terms versus the amount of physics terms, it'd be like, not it. <laughs> not it. <laughs> um, so... I've kind of, I've kind of scienced it. We're going to yes and it. We're going to make it work. Um, we have to make it work. We'll, we'll make it work. Um, That's so literally I, your job. <laughs> <laughs> this is right. Um, one of the things that I, I do like is that they brought up this idea of subspace, the subspace domain. Um, this, this idea that, you know, we have our sheet of space time. Subspace is really that area above or below the sheet. Now, we say the sheet, it's really three-dimensional, so it's kind of hard for our brains to conceptualize what that would look like in higher and higher dimensions. But if we shrink it down such that it's like a two-dimensional sheet, you have this area above and below that is higher dimensional that is subspace. Um, the subspace gets used in Star Trek all the time. I think pretty consistently and pretty consistently well. Things like, you know, subspace communications allow you to speak faster than the speed of light, to communicate faster than the speed of light. That works. That's a, that idea you've punched beacons through subspace. They communicate outside of the sheet of space time, and that's the limiter to being able to travel faster than the speed of light. So you can jump through there, no problem. Um, so let's, let's run with that. Let's say that this is, you know, subspace. Um, another thing that I really liked was just the visual that we had of the mycelial network when they first kind of travel through it. We got this visual that looks like fungus, you know, this is spore fungal sort of um, network that they have here. But my astrophysics brain kind of perked up and I was like, well, that not only looks like fungus, but it also kind of looks like this. And this is really the superstructure of our universe. Now these threads here that you're looking at are actually massive clusters of galaxies. So we'll, uh, you know, thinking about our cosmological address, we live on a planet, which is part of the solar system, which is one star system within our own Milky Way galaxy. Our galaxy is part of a galaxy cluster that we've not very imaginatively called the local group, um, but it's our Milky Way galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, and then a handful of smaller galaxies around there. We're all sort of gravitationally bound to each other. And then, uh, then there's other galaxy clusters throughout. And then you get these super clusters, clusters of clusters. And when you zoom all the way out, you can see this sort of threading network here. Another way to think about it, I actually got to see when I first started doing astronomy, working as a radio astronomer, I was working at sort of the universe type scale. And uh, I would see galaxies and you would just kind of see a thread as you're stepping back in distances, you see threads of galaxies just like this structure. So, 
what I'm proposing <laughs> is that this mycelial network is more of an allegory for the shape of this thread of network of matter that exists in subspace that we can tap into to jump from one point to another. Um, I would say the biggest flaw with this, first of all, we have the infinity comment. Now, is our universe infinite? Is it not? It, it does have a finite time. How far does it extend? All of those are, are ongoing questions, but let's just say it uh, the mycelium network expands into infinity in the sense that it expands into the entire universe that we can know and see. Um, that also kind of hurts my head when it comes to Star Trek a little bit because Star Trek has always taken place within the Milky Way galaxy. I mean, there's like an entire series based on a ship trying to get from one end of the galaxy to another end. Um, so, you know, this idea that now suddenly we can jump throughout the universe uh, is a little bit of a stretch. But um, but I, I think this isn't a terrible way to think about it. Um, I think it kind of works. And uh, so we'll just think of it more as like an allegory for this network of subspace and matter that we can tap into and jump between. I think work? that's amazing. I think that's amazing. That? Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now, one of the other things that I love with this is, all right, so if we're tapping into this network of subspace material, whatever it is, how do we actually use it? How do we utilize it? This comes back to the concept that I introduced earlier about E equals MC squared. If you want to play with space time, if you want to mess around with it, you're going to need energy um, because otherwise you'd have to have as much matter as you would need and that'd be like planet star scale type stuff um so you know these spores let's say these spores from this tardigrade something about them exist both in subspace as well as the normal space now when they sort of utilize initiate the spore drive what it's doing is it's capturing this let's say exotic energy we'll pull that from the uh, techno babble that we had earlier we pull this exotic energy that allows us to warp space-time in such a way that you can pop out and into this mycelial network and utilize it from there. If things go poorly and you don't necessarily have it targeted just right, you may end up on the other side of our universe, like the mirror universe. So this is you've punched up, but you misdirected it and you actually punched through to our alternate universe on the other side, our minus one times universe, otherwise known as the mirror universe. So. Or goatees are common. Where goatees are more common. Yes. <laughs> so I think that works. I think that works. That's beautiful. Well done. <laughs> Two thumbs up to you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, so I think uh, we had some other questions come in. I don't know if we want to go through them real quick. Um, we could do as many as we can. All right. That sounds good. Um, so uh, let me see. We had... Uh, the question from Heike asked, again, with that planet Pavo with the, the transmitter that I talked about earlier, but how realistic is the scenario of singing plants? That's I, a great question. So, yeah. I mean, the, the plants do, you know, the, it's been known for a while that plants can emit some sort of sound, sometimes these ultrasonic sort of sounds. Uh, it's also known that they can respond to sounds from other things. So there's, um, there's a process, too, where, where uh, what's it called? buzz pollination, whereas a bee approaches a plant, it buzzes it, and sometimes like a specific vibration will actually trigger it to, sh to shoot out the pollen onto the bee. So in that sense, I mean, you know, this communication, I don't know if it's communication between plants, but it's at least communication between insects and plants, kind of, in a way. I mean, I, I, wouldn't, say it's the, I wouldn't say it's the furthest thing out there. <laughs> gotcha. Awesome. Um, I think we have one more question that uh, we pretty much answered everyone else's questions so far. Um, but uh, Billy asked, is it possible for space-boring creatures like the crystalline entity to achieve warp speed? Um, how would that be possible to create, to biologically create matter and antimatter to sustain a warp? I love this question. This oh my God. Question. <laughs> Go Billy. Because um, too, with Ripper, I mean, technically when they first introduce Ripper, they say he's a space-born creature that is like a tardigrade. And then from yep, then on, true. they just Good point. use tardigrade interchangeably. Um, but so kind of coming off of that, I mean, I used in my sort of half effort explanation for how the spore drive works that maybe Ripper exists in multiple dimensions beyond what uh, we have here. So I would compare that to like the crystalline entity and some of these other creatures that we've seen. Um, their ability to tap into subspace would allow them to travel faster than the speed of light, just like our subspace comms aren't restricted by that sheet, that limit. When you're on the surface of space-time, you can't travel faster than the speed of light. Um, but if you're outside of that, somehow you'd be able to, to jump. So saying that they're building a warp, like the crystalline entity is building a warp bubble, that might just be, you know, when you look at the explanation for how warp drive works and how when you use that matter and antimatter, what you're doing is you're generating a lot of energy to warp space-time to build your warp bubble. 
Um, and you build that bubble into subspace. Again, sheet of space times subspace up here. Build a warp bubble that goes up into subspace. That could be more like what the crystalline entity is doing. It's not necessarily generating matter and antimatter, but it's just tapping into subspace and building a warp bubble somehow um, that's able to do that. Does that make sense? Does that work? Beautiful. Love awesome. it. All right. Cool. Well, I think that's it from us. So uh, awesome. thank you to everyone who sent in questions. Uh, we love giving this talk. Um, we got to oh, thank yeah. Laura so. Glopper too, for this wonderful art of the two of us being Star Trek geeks together. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. <laughs> no, I mean, we each have some, we actually have a YouTube channel. We each have some books uh, there. You can see them here, but thank you for joining us. And, and we'll hopefully see you in person at DragonCon 2021. Yes, indeed. Live long and prosper. Thanks. L -L